So it's really complex problem solving by looking at systems, whether that's working with uh, food retailers or you know packaging companies or doing urban design work. You know, it's this kind of idea of looking at where do we get stuck in problems and look at nature and where it does it differently. Orbiting 250 miles above, the space station provides us with the ultimate view of planet Earth. From this perspective, we ask our guests to engage with six questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. For the next few minutes, this is our wonder space. Welcome to the 125th episode of the Wonder Space podcast. My name is Steve Cole, and over the past three years, I have asked the same six questions to amazing people from around the world. Questions that orbit around wonder and stories of hopefulness. This week, we're going to dive into nature-inspired innovation, also known as biomimicry, a practice that mimics the strategies found in nature to solve human design challenges. Our guest this week is the founder and creative director of the Biomimicry Innovation Lab, Richard James McCowan, who works with innovators and designers to develop future possibilities inspired by nature. With a focus on the future of cities, agriculture and manufacturing, the lab's mission is to develop regenerative innovations fit for the challenges of now and the future. With this expansive overview of Earth, I start by asking Richard, if we could do a fly past over any part of the world that is significant to you, which place, city or country would it be and why? For me, it's really gone back to Scotland, where I grew up. And I used to spend my um, summer holidays going up to see my grandparents on the West Coast. And, you know, that's, when you look at a map, it doesn't look that big. But, you know, for the, crow, the way the crow flies, you know, it could be about 20 minutes. But driving around all these little roads through forests, past lochs, you know, into the wilderness, you know, that kind of, that's important to me. And it's kind of remembering those things from, you know, where I grew up with. I, you know, I live in England now and it's, you know, yes, it's part of the United Kingdom, but it's those things and memories of my childhood of learning about the beauty of nature and but also learning about the brutality of it as well at the same time. You know, it's a battle for survival and that's really important to me. So, yeah, doing a flyover. Another benefits of doing a flyover in the summer is you're avoiding all the midges so you're not getting eaten alive by these swarms of billions of little insects flying around. Richard, give us a glimpse into your life story so far with an emphasis on what you're doing currently. Yeah, so it's back to what the flyover, as I mentioned. That was really, probably really understood and kind of where one was taught, but kind of it brought out to me kind of the importance of looking at systems and looking at the bigger system as well. And that's really been important throughout my life. Um, you know, moved around a bit as a family. And um, I've always been interested in kind of the natural world. But Despite that, I've um, yeah, I started off with uh, working in real estate, the property sector, and realised I didn't really like that because you know I didn't really want to wear a shiny suit, and it was it wasn't just about making money for um, faceless people. Um, then I retrained in design and urbanism, which really brought back to this um, idea of building nature into cities and into the built environment. It's, and it, that from that journey, kind of brought into the idea of biomimicry which I realised I did a project at school about back in the early 1990s. It clicked because it was just a different way of problem solving. You know, we've all interested in nature, whether you've got kids, you'll pick up a shell, you know, pine cone, whatnot, you're in, you'll look at it by exploring deeper understanding what those, you look at the structure, look at the substance the material's made out of, look at the energy that you just went into it, or compare that to, you know, how we traditionally have made materials. It's really fascinating to understand that, you know, people are doing that from, you know, making, and that, that's kind of been the focus of my work. So I created my non-profit, Biomarkey UK, um, over 10 years ago until my consulting and innovation work with Biomarkey Innovation Lab. So it's really complex problem solving by looking at systems 
whether that's working with uh, food relators, retailers, sorry, um, or you know, packaging companies or doing urban design work. You know, it's this kind of idea of looking at where can we, where do we get stuck in problems and can and, and look at nature and where it does it differently. We also work in um, kind of social innovation with two projects through the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, we're working in Madagascar, looking at creating um, creating energy out of pine needles, um, and also working in uh, in Kerala in India, where we're looking at um, women-led uh, initiatives for the fishing community. So that's around climate adaptation, mitigation, and generating new income streams. Where on earth is your place of reset or recharge? So one of the things I go to reach re recharge, I just go running. I go running down by the river. The river's in York, and because York's not a big city, and it, uh, it's about 10 minutes away for me to get into the countryside, or even less if I'm flying around. And that that's perfect. I can just run in the countryside, you know, past the cows, uh, you know, through the fields, and something, stop, take pictures or something. It's just And that that's my way of kind of getting away from it all. You know, I do that or going out on my bicycle, and it's, it's not going far away, it's just getting into the natu natural world and the countryside just n near where I am. And I, we tend to do that with my kids as well. You know, get them off the screens, take them to play around, do nature hunts and just find ways to just forget about that piece of technology that you're always wanting to check, even though you don't need to. What wonder of the natural world excites you the most? I can't just say one. It... it Generally, is in my you know day to day work. It's just everything that's what excites me about getting involved with this. You know, you can get intrigued by going into your garden or even just a pot plant on your windowsill and start exploring that. From you know looking at how the colours are, are are created and and the plant leaf how it captures sunlight. You know, it transports fluids around and the root structure and everything. And you can just delve into that. So it's just it's the natural world full stop. It's quite hard to ask somebody who works in biomimicry one thing. <laughs> Whilst orbiting around wonder, here is another one minute wonder from our friends at Ask Nature, who are also part of the global biomimicry family. Electric eels and rays can deliver quite a jolt enough electricity to stun predators and prey alike. How do they do it? On each side of their bodies are electrical organs made up of alternating flattened cells and fluid-filled gaps. While each plate only produces a small shock, the cumulative effect of several plates connected in series in a stack and of stacks connected in parallel can be devastating. This arrangement is basically the same setup as that found inside a traditional human-made electrical battery. And this is no coincidence. After thousands of years of human interest in electric fish, Italian chemist Alessandro Volta in the late 18th century built the first human-made battery. And he designed it to mimic the natural batteries found inside the animals that filled him with wonder. Electric fish. Richard, what is your story of hopefulness that's not your own, about a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? So I really like the work of Clover Hogan and um, what her and her team are doing at um, Force of Nature. You know, it's not only about, you know, getting people understanding about the client initi initiatives for younger people, but she does a lot of work and mentions a lot of it on social media around equal anxiety. You, know, you speak to a lot of people as, about this and where where are we going? You know, it doesn't matter how much you try and get either clients or, you know, at home to try and do different. It does seem that we're swimming against the tide. But it's really interesting to read her work and it really taps into this positive news. And there is hope for we keep pushing this way because we're seeing that with changes in, you know, the way people are, are voting as well. And hopefully it's, it's going to, change the way we're doing things of kind of making it very much more mainstream as we're seeing anyway so i really expect the work of art a lot more of the younger generation coming through and actually having a voice like this and putting it out there 
Finally, as we prepare to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, what insight, wisdom or question would you like to leave with us? The one thing that I always say to people, whether it's in my talks or everything, or just having a chat is, you know, especially with biomimicry, everybody looks around for solutions. It's just about looking a little bit deeper. Like when I talked about, you know, where do we find ideas from? It's just delving into that. Look a bit de deeper into this. And it, it can spark your imagination. You know, you know, whether it's creativity for children or looking into new ideas, just pick something up and then do a bit of research into it how that material's made, you know, how's it growing, how's this, you know, the structure there, what the communication, what is it part of the bigger network, the system it came from. So it's kind of slowing down and looking things slightly differently. So that's 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 my tip for, for people listening to this, is just start looking at things slightly differently than they normally do. To find out more, go to biomimicryinnovationlab.com. In his story of hopefulness, Richard talks about Clover Hogan, and you can find out more at cloverhogan.com. I want to thank Richard for joining us on Wonder Space this week and for engaging with our six questions in such a brilliant way. I finish with a question to you. What is your story of hopefulness that's not your own about a person, business or non-profit who are doing amazing things for the world? A story that makes a name for someone else. Thanks for listening.